How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to another edition of Stupid Questions Podcast. Uh, today on the pod, we're going to be talking with Scott Tyndall. He is the uh, co-founder of Fuel In. This is the round two interview with him. Uh, we dive deep into a lot of what's going on at Fuel In. We talk a little bit about marriage and family there at the end and um, talk about, yeah, all kinds of cool things. He's a really smart, wise guy, uh, obviously been through a lot, has a lot of rich experience. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with me and Scott. Really quick before we start the show, I want to say, first of all, thank you so much for listening. It has been such a wild journey over the past year making these episodes for each and every one of you guys. And I cannot believe that we're already on episode 90, which means we are coming up on episode 100, which is a bit of a milestone for me and for you guys for obvious reasons. So here's what I'm thinking. For episode 100, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to allow you guys to ask the questions and I'm going to do more or less and ask me anything. I think I've had a lot of opportunity to ask lots of people deep things about their lives. And I thought it might be something fun for you guys who are invested. It's not a huge group of you, but for to allow you the opportunity to ask me some questions about who I am, why I'm doing what I'm doing, or it can be fun. It can be silly. It can be deep. It can be whatever you guys want. I don't really have a huge expectation. So I am going to, in the link, post a um, form where you guys can submit those questions. So if you are interested in doing that, make sure to check out the link in the description and you can submit those questions. If you can't figure that out and you want to just shoot us a message on any of the platforms, you can also do that. So thank you so much. And I will let you guys get back to listening to the podcast. So I interrupted, obviously, because the internet kind of petered out there for a second. But you were saying, uh, what was the name of the guy again? He was a Maple Leafs and did yeah, some his, other stuff. His name's uh, Matt Herring. Okay. And uh, he's just a, he's a great guy, but um, oh, I don't know. Are we recording or not? Yeah, we are. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, I, I always think, like, it's the number one rule, isn't it? Just hit record. Don't, exactly. Don't, don't wait because then yeah, you say something Yeah, you might miss good. something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I think it's a classic case. Like this is what I find with the amazing strength and conditioners I've worked with. Mm-hmm. They're probably just not that good at business. <laughs> and so you have these you have these guys who just are so amazing at training people with, mm-hmm. you know, training philosophies, training programs and get results, but they're not influencers. And so – they get left behind, behind crap yeah. people. And you're sort of like, man, I wish I could help these guys out. So, yeah, like Matty, I mean, he, he's just, yeah, I, I feel like he just needs a bit of a leg up, like in that sense, and get his name out there because once yeah. they start doing that, and then the other guy would be Craig McFarlane or Oscar. Uh, he was okay. the head of head of strength, uh, head of performance with me at Oracle. Yeah. He was head of performance at Saracens Rugby in the UK. Um he works with um, the Sale GP teams, like the Danish team, the American team. You know, he's worked in America's Cup, blah, blah, blah. But, again, same thing, like just phenomenal strength and conditioning coach, both amazing yeah. human beings and just yeah. probably just need to get their name out there so people can sort of, you know, tap into what they have. So Anyway, yeah, no, I'll, for I'll, sure. connect I'd love to... I'll connect you with them. Yeah, and, uh, I, it's been really fun, obviously. I mean <laughs> – Naturally, I think just it's been easiest to do triathletes just because that's what the network is. But I originally started to reach out a little bit more into the cycling community. Uh, Phil Guyman, after a year of pestering him, he said yes, finally. And, you know, some other guys, a similar story. So persistence pays off. But it's been good. Like, it'd be, it'd be awesome to have more people on to give a platform. Because I think at the end of the day, man, everybody has a story, no matter their walk of life. And as long as they're a half-decent human being, it's it's interesting to listen to and to understand how people think why people think the way they think and it's it's fun i love having the deeper philosophical conversations too after you kind of get through some of the stuff to help people feel like calm and in the element and okay i can kind of share safely if that makes sense well both both maddie and oscar uh will be definitely down for the philosophical chats so uh they they're very grounded people they're probably not as hyper as me so uh (laughs) Yeah, no, they're great guys. But I mean, the other thing is you got to remember, and we, I don't know if you just saw Training Peaks, Training Peaks just did a post about it. And it was an article I wrote about fueling for strength. And, mm-hmm. you know, we had a couple of questions going, oh, can we make this applicable to cyclists? And it's like, well, it is applicable to cyclists. <laughs> like, yeah. like, okay, the program you do is specific to whatever the sport you're doing, but the nutrition 
the principles behind that doesn't matter if you're a triathlete yeah. you're a strength if you're a, a gym or a strength athlete if you're a, a cyclist if you're a runner if you're a ice hockey player like the philosophies in terms of nutrition and the principles there are going to stay the same so mm. it, it was a nice um like a nice infographic we did it based around lighter athletes like we did it for mm. i think a, a 55 and a 75 kilo athlete which i thought would be sort of considered the average especially when talking about triathletes but the comments yeah. coming back are like can you give us examples of what we need to eat for heavier athletes and <laughs> I, I guess that's the reality of uh society yeah. today isn't it like there are a lot of heavier people and so i, I just reached out to training peaks then and said let's do let's do one for heavier heavier athletes and yeah. you know show them what they should be eating you know before potentially during often not required and then certainly afterwards to maximize the gains yeah i'm curious with with that um hopefully this isn't too touchy of a subject but yolo um for our heavier athletes if someone is overweight would you would you change the nutrition regimen based on like not only weight, but also like BMI or any of that stuff, because it, in, at least in my mind, it's like, oh, if somebody is heavier weight, like they do to a degree need to consume more, but if they're like overweight, you don't want to try to feed that number, right? Or is that wrong? Uh, look, there is equations based on fat-free mass and then body body mass, and Dr. Alan McCubbin and I were talking about the intricacies of this. The, the reality is, is you could probably base it on either or and as long as you push them into a calorie deficit it doesn't really matter and now yeah. again it's a little bit of guesswork around it even if you're you know basing it on fat free mass versus total body mass um, what you're also taking into account is like their physical activity throughout the day their mm -hmm. resting metabolic rate heavier people have a higher resting metabolic rate so mm -hmm. the bigger you are even if you're obese you will have a much higher resting metabolic rate than someone who's lighter and leaner, Interesting. Um, which is really important. So as people start to lose weight, you have to adjust what their resting metabolic rate is and start to drop that down because that's actually what's happening. So that, I mean, that is part drop. of, yeah, that's part of the process of losing weight because you think about it, like in order to keep yourself going, if you're very heavy, you're going to have to produce more energy at rest. It sort of makes sense, but it's only when you actually think about it, you're like, oh, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, lean mass, look, it, it's – we're doing a review of the algorithm that we use at Fuel In and taking into account, like, a percentage of body weight. Um, you can use a BMI, and BMI will work for a lot of people. Obviously, it doesn't work for heavily muscled – certainly very athletic population doesn't work as well but again it's it's like you know you can dive for majority of people these basic equations will work and yeah. i think all too often people will try and say oh that doesn't work for me but the reality is you know what you consume if if what you're consuming is under what you're expending you will lose weight yeah i imagine that with the work that you're doing with fuel and i mean i'm I don't know how much it's grown in the past year, so I'd love to hear about that. But I imagine you have just interesting conversations all the time with people in the experts of these fields. And to like, because you said you just changed your algorithm, but that's being influenced by these conversations or studies that you guys are going over and whatnot. So is, it, is that an accurate assessment? Yeah. I mean, you know, in the background, uh, Alan, uh, Dr. Alan McCubbin, who's a you know, a fellow of Sports Dietitians Australia and a lecturer at Monash University. He's part of our team. And then we have Megan Foley, who's a registered dietitian uh, based in Utah. I mean, we're constantly talking and reviewing what's going on. And I think <clears throat> that's part of the attraction of what we're doing at Fuelin. I think for practitioners like Megan and Alan is, and it's something Alan certainly has said to me over and over again. He, he's like, I love the fact that you haven't said this is it, this is the formula, and that's it. We're not doing anything further with it. Like we're always looking at it and saying, okay, what's what's the research showing with protein? What is the research with, you know, carbohydrates versus fat? What is, you know, how can we look at a meal timing? Is that important? Is it as important mm. as what we once thought? What are the driving factors behind either fat loss, weight loss, performance, and how can we 
bring in new data sets within that algorithm to make it more accurate for the outliers. So what we've seen with the data when we're reviewing the data is that if you think of a typical bell curve, we're covering 90 odd percent of athletes really, really well. But we also acknowledge there are those outliers on the edges on the left and the right, either the very light athletes or the very heavy athletes, where maybe we are missing it a little bit, either overfeeding or underfueling. Mm. Um, and that's something we're working really hard on to try and improve that automation. So at the moment, we might have to manually go in and update that based on athlete feedback. And that's fine. That's... I guess what a, a typical process for a nutrition expert would be working with an athlete, but obviously we want to be able to extend it to be more automated and be, um, you know, I guess automatic for the athlete that they know what they're getting is, is absolutely bang on for what their requirements are. And I, I'll give you an example, like, you know, if we're basing things on grams per kilo and we're looking at total energy requirements, you, you might have an athlete who's very, very light but actually can produce a hell of a lot of power. And their caloric expenditure is obviously going to be significantly higher than a similar weight athlete who can produce, you know, let's say 50% of what they're producing. You know, you might have an athlete who can produce, you know, might have an FTP of 280 or 300, and then a similar, another similar age group athlete might only have an FTP of 150 or 160. Mm -hmm. Obviously, their caloric expenditure is significantly different. And yeah. so we're now looking to account for that by collecting what we're going to be doing in the beta is collecting FTP, for instance. So if you have a power meter and you know your FTP, then you can enter that in. Otherwise, we'll take it default based on persona. Um, so yeah. we'll split, split the athletes up into sort of professional, elite, recreational and sort of newbie. Um, and there are there's sort of data sets around that that we can use at least to provide a better understanding and also a better estimate of um, energy requirements for those athletes. Yeah, super interesting. So for the algorithm that you guys are using, is it is another way to say algorithm just like a formula like that you guys use that take into account all these parameters or is there is there like very specific decision tree type stuff happening where it's like, okay, these come into here and it feeds in and this gives you this output, that output. Like how complicated is that if, that, if I'm allowed to ask that question? <laughs> It's pretty complicated. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's quite scary when you look at sort of the, the back end sort of uh, calculations and everything going on. And I guess that's the, the interesting thing about it. I mean, what we've tried to do in one of our pillars at Fuel In is simple. Um, you know, we have simple results and personalized as our pillars that we, we try and stand by. And so ultimately for the athlete, the athlete sees these three colors, you know, red is lower amounts of carbs, yellow is moderate and green is higher. So it's simple in that sense. They start to become conditioned like Pavlov's dog. You know, you see red and you're like, okay, I know that's a lower amount of carbs. I know what I'm eating there. Green, okay, happy days. I'm eating a lot more carbs. So that simplicity is great. The athlete sees that. But behind that, I think we're, we're up, you know, it's over 100 sort of odd calculations for every single mm. meal, for every single day that's going into it. And that will get better as well. So, you know, machine learning is being integrated. And what we're, what we're so excited about is the possibility, I think, where what we're going to be doing different compared to everyone else is looking at not just diet quantity, but diet quality. And I think that this will be the real game change for what we're doing and what we're going to be doing better than, you know, even, you know, the other competitors in our market, but or certainly the big players in terms of companies like, you know, MyFitnessPal and Noom and stuff like that. I think we mm -hmm. can we can extend way beyond that in that we can start to look at, you know, what is an athlete consuming? Don't just hit your macros. Hit your macros mm -hmm. with quality nutrition when it's applicable. Yeah. So, you know, how, how many how much fruit and vegetables are you eating on a daily, on a weekly, on a monthly basis? How does that uh, transpire into fiber intake on a daily basis? Mm. Are you getting enough fiber? Because we know that fiber is probably going to be one of the key factors in terms of overall health. You know, you talk about gut health and fiber is mm. what, you know, your, your little gut microbiome feeds on. Yeah, and so every, 
everyone's searching for like, how do I improve gut health? It's like, well, eat more fiber. That's probably the first step. Don't worry yeah. about supplements and things like that. Just eat more fruit and vegetables. Now yeah. you then you then have to layer that in to how does an athlete build that in and around their training in order to minimize the risk of GI complaints. Mm. So you don't want to be going and smashing a heap of spinach and broccoli, you know, 30 to 60 minutes before you're going and doing a, a zone three, four, you know, threshold and hold session uh, and on the bike with a run. Well, you just don't want a heap of fiber sitting in your gut because you'll probably, you, you know what will end up happening. So yeah. that's where, me- <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's where meal timing, that's where meal timing does become important. Because now you're looking at implementing specific nutrition strategies for health and performance. And, and I think that's where, like, we do that already. We already give, um, you know, recommendations around timing of meals, when to reduce mm-hmm. fiber, when to include vegetables. You know, we talk about fists of vegetables. We do that already in a simplistic manner. What we're excited about is, you know, AI, machine learning coming in, looking at the individual and not just looking at, okay, based on these timings, but what are you doing as an individual athlete? How does that compare against the huge data set that we've already got? Mm -hmm. And then then you could extrapolate based on even the athletic data set, but then also just general pop. And that's... That's super exciting when you start to have that sort of amount of data at your fingertips that you can start to really show insights to the individual athlete compared against similar gender, similar age, similar type of athlete. Mm. And I I think that's what people are looking for now. They really want that personal insight into what are they doing from a nutrition perspective. Like macros Mm. are cool. Macros are cool. Like everyone gets off on their their macros and, you know, once they get into it and they understand a little bit more about protein and carbs and fat, you know, they might talk about how much they take in. But at the end of the day, those calculations aren't that hard. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, you're talking about around it. Yeah. So you're talking about quality, like obviously it's, you know, French fries versus whatever, you know, healthier food. But I wish that there was a way... And there is, so have you heard of the BRICS scale or the BRICS, BRICS. test? BRICS, right. yeah, it's like B-R-I-X. So you can, if if you're into farming or if you want to grow your own vegetables and, you know, have your own garden, something I'd recommend doing is getting like a BRICS test. And if it, essentially you take your soil, you send it in, and I believe it's a measurement of how much the light bends when it comes through the soil as as a function of telling you like how much nitrogen is in the soil, how much, you know, and there's all these factors and you can get like a soil test health. Um, you can actually make a lot of soil better by adding salt water or like sea water or salt into the soil. But anyway, I say that because what I've learned um, over the past years from a couple of my friends and then doing it some of my own with gardening is like all vegetables are not grown equally. So you go to the Walmart or wherever, you know, the equivalent is of whatever country you may be in you grab the peppers, the yellow peppers, green peppers off the shelf, and then you were to go measure the nutritional content of that versus, you know, what you grew at home free of all of the junk that, you know, gets sprayed on foods to, to make big ag possible. And, that, and don't get me wrong, I'm not kind of banging on big agriculture because it enables the world to be fed, but I wish there was a way where you could like hold up your phone or like do a short test to figure out, okay, what's the nutritional value of this head of broccoli compared to, you know, what it used to be even 10 years ago? Because I've heard that's how a lot of disease has kind of increased over time. It's just like what we're eating is not of the same nutritional value. So when's fueling going to do that, I guess is what I'm asking. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think there's a couple of things there we could dive into. Um, Yes, I mean, there are, what I understand is that there is some nutritional um decline in certain vegetables and that's due to the quality of the soil um, due to over farming so things like magnesium for instance there is appears to be reductions in the quality um yeah that's that's just mass farming i guess it's looking at uh ways in which farming can change certainly here in australia there is a push for sort of going back to some of that older style where you're um cycling you know, the animals through the paddocks and, you know, mm-hmm. using good farming techniques so you're not over, um, what's the word, you're not... Overuse. Uh, yeah, overuse or depleting the soil mm-hmm. based on just, you know, too much too soon. So 
I think I can't remember what they call that. Like, there's a term for that type of farming that they've brought back in. But um, yeah, look, I, I think that's obviously if you can grow your vegetables and you can be in control of that, it's a luxury. A lot of people don't have that. I think yeah. to your to your point that it's blamed for things like disease and health crises and obesity and all that. I, I call bullshit. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Give me what like, you got. People, you eat broccoli regardless if it's you know, slightly less in uh, you know certain vitamins and minerals. Sure. That stuff ain't causing the obesity crisis. Yeah, it didn't it's, make you go to McDonald's and grab the burger. No, correct. Yeah. It's ultra-processed yeah. processed foods that are most likely contributing to an overconsumption of total calorie intake versus people being pretty lazy these days, not walking anywhere, not taking stairs, not doing enough physical exercise based on even the American, you know, if you talk about like the American Medical Association and sort of yeah. the minimum requirements for exercise, like that's why there's a health and disease epidemic in relation to being overweight or obese. Like it's, it's food in that mm -hmm. sense, but it's not the vegetables. Yeah. And I think when you see people talking shit about vegetables are killing people, it's like, come on, dude. Like, <laughs> don't confuse yeah. people with that. Like, I mean, you, sure. you see, you know, the carnivore diet and that, and it's like, dude, like, as, yeah, you, you'll see Lane Norton absolutely rip into these guys, which I think is hilarious. And Ripping into the carnivore diet people? Oh, yeah. I mean, to Paul Saladino and that. I mean, you've only got to go on Lane Norton's, uh, you know, Instagram and he'll just absolutely tear them a new one, which is great. You know, like, you know, look at the human randomized controlled studies. Look at the systematic reviews. Look at the meta-analyses. Like, there is no evidence that consumption of vegetables and fruits is killing people. If yeah. anything, it's reducing all-cause mortality, and that's pretty clear in the evidence and the literature. So, you know, you have these idiots getting on there and confusing people that, you know, they're mm -hmm. going to kill you. Yeah, what does that yeah, do for people's not. health? So, yeah, it's it's tough when you're, you're coming up against these type of influencers who certainly have... Yeah, they have the. It comes back to that conversation around you know those those really amazing strength and conditioning coaches. They're the mm -hmm. people that people should be listening to because they understand strength and conditioning. They understand the physiology. They understand the individual needs of these individuals to get the most out of them. Same with you know experts in nutrition or experts mm -hmm. in physiology, whatever it is. You know, unfortunately, a lot of those people don't speak loud enough. Yeah. Um, and, and they get drowned out by these idiots who, uh, who are so-called experts and influencers on, on mm -hmm. Instagram. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting the the how, yeah, it's interesting how, um, sometimes in popular media, charisma is sometimes mis mistaken for wisdom, I think. Um, yeah. I think is the, probably the best way to put it. Definitely. I mean, the, the other thing there, mate, is, yeah, you, you go the other extreme and, you talk about clean eating, which you sort of hinted at there with like your vegetables and, you know, is the quality of this and clean eating. And then you have the other extreme of like orthorexia and where people are so focused on eating clean, whatever eating clean means, that they actually yeah. miss the point of taking in enough calories to meet their needs. And you'll see yeah. this with extreme athletes. So, um, yeah, you might, and, and it might be one of those situations where an athlete works with someone, maybe a coach, and the coach cleans up their diet, so say, and I say clean up in inverted commas, but maybe they yeah. remove a lot of the processed foods that this athlete was eating on a, on a basis. And in doing that, that's removing a huge amount of energy intake. So then the athlete starts to lose weight, potentially loses body fat, maybe starts to improve and start to perform a little bit better. And they're like, oh, my God, this clean eating is amazing. But then mm -hmm. it continues to decline. So their mm -hmm. energy intake is still under what they're requiring because they're eating clean, only vegetables, only organic produce, blah, blah, blah. And then over time, they're chronically in this state of low energy availability. Over time, now you start to develop signs and symptoms of, REDS, relative energy deficiency in sport, even though they're eating really well, 
But mm. the point being, they're under consuming calories. And I'm talking yeah. about, you know, very high performing athletes where this happens. Uh, mm. And it can, I mean, it can happen to any athlete, to be honest. But yeah. in particular, what I've seen is some of these very high performing athletes who do clean up their diet, remove those ultra processed processed foods, and then inadvertently and sub and unconsciously push themselves into a chronic energy deficit and that then has yeah. negative consequences as well so you have these two sort of sides of the equation which ultimately what we're trying to do with fuel in is try and balance that up and, and get athletes to recognize you know if you need to lose weight you need to improve body composition okay how much of a deficit do you need to go in how do you do that in a systematic way if you're under fueling how do you actually take in more fuel and how do you do that appropriately to meet your needs so to therefore reduce the risk of injury illness and so on yeah and so with fuel and doing that um like how close is that because I, I i i'm sad to say i haven't actually used it yet and this is i probably oh, should mate, like get on there mate, and check come on <laughs> <laughs> i need to actually use it this is like really bad we'll um, have to get you on I will actually get on. I'm going to make that a point to after this. But so I'm asking from a I'll sort you a out, point mate. of don't worry. I'll sort okay. you out. <laughs> I'm asking from a point of stupidity then, but if I get in there and you know it starts making recommendations based on energy outputs and things like that, um, how specific do I have to be with the inputs? Like obviously I'm going to put in what I'm eating, but in terms of a cup of raisins and you know a quarter cup of nuts or however the measurements are, like that seems like it's going to be pretty important for the feedback information to come back to, to where I can, like you said, have that systematic approach. Yeah. Um, so how much fudge room is there, I guess, is what I'm asking. Look, I, I think we always talk about targets. It's not absolutes. And I think that is a really important point for athletes to understand. And I was talking about mm -hmm. this yesterday with a bunch of athletes is like, don't be hung up if, you go five over, 10 over, or five under, 10 under in terms of grams of whatever it is you're tracking. At the end of the day, there's always the issues with tracking in itself. Like even from a, a perspective of a nutrition label, it may not be 100% accurate what you're looking at right. on, on food packaging. Yeah, it's all so, rounded numbers. So don't, don't get so hung up. It's trends over time. And let, let's say, for instance, you... Um, you know, you start using fuel in, <clears throat> we're recommending somewhere between two and three grams per kilo body weight of protein to you. And you're looking at this, you start tracking and you're like, holy shit, I'm eating like half of what they're recommending me on a daily basis. Now we can probably, if you're tracking somewhat accurately, we could probably accurately say, Seth, you are under consuming protein. And that is going to have a negative consequence on your ability to recover, your ability to adapt, and could have a negative impact on potentially your immunity and whatnot. So what do we got to do? Okay, let's focus on bumping up your protein. So now you're purposely increasing the volume of protein containing foods and protein foods and tracking those. And now you start to see those numbers creep up. And yes, it may not be exact to the gram, but now your trend is in the right direction and then subjectively, you know, we record subjective well-being questions like, um, do you know what they are? I don't. Okay. So they're, they're simple questions that are validated against a lot of objective measures like HRV, heart rate, things like that. So simple okay. questions like, how's your mood? How's your sleep? How's your energy? Muscle soreness, things like that. And it's on a what we call a like it scale. So a one to five scale. You fill that in daily. What you hopefully start to see is you start to take in more protein, for instance, you might say, oh, mm. actually, my motivation to train is better. Actually, my recovery is better. Actually, my sleep's improving. Oh, wow, mm. I, I've gone from a two every day. Now I'm trending into a three. Sometimes I'm a four. Okay, now you know you're hitting sort of the correct ballparks. Yeah. And that's ultimately what you say. Yes, we have little rings where you're you know, it's gamified in that sense. You're trying to get your every meal, you try and get the rings right. And every day you're trying to get the rings right in terms of total, total intake. But, you know, if you go a little bit over, don't be upset. If you go a little bit under, don't be upset. Um, yeah. You know, that's where it is focusing on quantity. So portions might become important. And then you're thinking, okay, 
you might say to me, I had an athlete the other day and they were like, I hit my macros all the time, but you know, I'm, I'm always hungry. Why is that? And then you go through the food diary and you're like, yeah, because you're eating a protein bar. It's perfect. It's got 20 macros, you know, 20 grams of protein. It's got 10 grams of fat and it's got 30 grams of carbs. And they're like, yeah, it's perfect. It hits the macros perfectly. I'm like, how big is it? And it's like, you know, one and a half inches big. And I'm like, how many bites was that? And they're like, two. And I was like, how'd you feel after it? And they're like, man, I was so hungry. So <laughs> the quality of how they're hitting the macros now becomes important. I said, let's have a look at how much fiber you're taking in every day. Oh, he's like, what do you mean? And I said, how many, how much fruit and vegetables are you eating? And he's like, I don't eat any. Oh my. And, and I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, I have half a cup of blueberries in the morning. And I said, let's look like loosely through, like he was tracking with my fitness pal. Let's look at what your estimated fiber intake is. Super low, like under 15 grams a day. He thought he was getting it, most of his fiber from that half cup of blueberries. Oh yeah. Well, and his estimation was like 15 grams from blueberries. Half a cup of blueberries gives you about one or two grams of fiber. <laughs> so then he's like, I'm like, okay, well, let's purposely increase your intake of vegetables at lunch and dinner. So let's start trying to aim for, you know, two, three fists, holding up a fist of vegetables mm -hmm. as a simple measure to get in. Don't care what it is, whether it's broccoli, whether it's broccolini, eggplant, you know, kale, baby spinach, arugula, whatever. What does that start to do? It starts to bulk out the meal. So large, um, large bulk of food to get through, which obviously you've got to then spend time eating. Low calorie density in that food, high fiber content. High fiber content is going to make you feel fuller for longer. Suddenly he's like, oh, yeah, wow, okay. Gee, I took a long time to eat my lunch or a long time to eat my dinner. Gee, I felt incredibly full afterwards. But that plate of vegetables probably had the equivalent, you know, probably less than that one and a half inch bar. Mm. And so you, you've you got to be thinking, yes, quantity and macro targets are important, but then look at the quality of what you're consuming at the same time. And that's where I think, Again, going back to the original conversation, that's where I think the evolution of personalized nutrition is and what we're going to be doing with Fuelin is really where it's going to come into its own. Yeah. When does the beta come out for this? The Well, <laughs> the new app will be released. Uh, so we're, we're doing a big new app build. Um, I'm sort okay. of dropping. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or not, but uh, the new app. Oh, let me know. I can bleep it out. It'll be a few, no, several cool. weeks. It's cool. Okay. It's cool. Okay. Uh, we're, we're excited about it. So, and it's cool just to get people excited about it. So um, yeah, new app build. I think it will come out probably we're aiming for Kona, but it might be a little bit after Kona. Okay. Now, like all these things with tech, they always take a little bit longer than you anticipate. Sure. Um, and then the V2 algorithm will sort of come around similar time. Now, the machine learning element of it, like building all that in. Um, you it Yeah, probably. We'll do a lot of testing. We've got a beta group in Fuel In where we invite athletes into that, uh, which is really cool, and they give a lot of feedback. So we'll start bringing mm -hmm. in that element and probably Q1. So um, when, when you say the, the AI side of it, is this like are you guys building your own large language model around this? Is that what's happening? Or are you building on top of someone else's? Or is it even is it a different type of AI situation? That's, Are you allowed uh, to say? But, no, no, that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal is build the models within. So okay. we, we're talking to some people who uh, hopefully will become part of the, the Fuel In team. Yeah. Uh, and they have uh, a PhD in machine learning and a master's in, oh, in machine beautiful. learning. So, uh, you know, I would regard this individual as an expert in machine learning um, because they actually have studied and worked in it for a long time as opposed to a lot of these individuals who yeah. will claim being experts in machine learning despite only being in it for six months. Oh, uh, so yeah. I think I think that's exciting and yeah, you know, we're I think it's giving sort of that license to that individual to sort of, you know, flex their flex their AI muscles, I guess, within yeah. the program. And yes, yeah, I mean you're gonna lean on things like Chat GPT and stuff, but I think sure. as you start to build those models within it and then start to get smarter with the data sets that we've got 
that that's what's going to be incredibly exciting. Yeah. So I'm also curious then with, you know, all these different models that can be built from my limited knowledge here, you have to have a lot of data, but I imagine as you guys continue to grow your user base, like, are you not only logging, like, are you keeping track of all that data and and kind of keeping it in house, everything that is implemented and typed in? So how much data are you guys pulling in per day or week or whatever now? Do you know? Oh, God, I couldn't tell you. It's a lot. But it all stays in-house. We've made yeah. a, a very conscious decision. We don't share yeah, it with Yeah, like anyone. servers in the back type of deal? Yeah. yeah. Wow, well, a lot of it's expensive. cloud. I guess a lot of it's yeah. cloud. Okay. So, yeah, you use AWS and all that sort yeah. of stuff. So, But, yeah. yeah, it starts to get expensive. You you think, uh, you know, you, you look at a company like ours and you, you say, oh, it's brilliant. You don't have any real product that you've got to produce. And then, you know, that's how I thought about it initially. And then you start looking at what data costs. So uh, yeah, it's insane. Yeah, there, there's certainly uh, costs associated with it. Yeah. Um, I know what I was going to say. Sorry, I went on a tangent before. You you were talking about like, yep. you know, if you get into it and you you start, you know, tracking and you start looking at it. I think something that we have integrated already, which is, you know, AI based is what we call Scooter, which is an AI food tracker. And the feedback on it, it's really cool because we, we get feedback from athletes and Initially, we did integrate with my. Well, we do integrate with my fitness power and lose it, which is yeah, really cool. And they're great companies, and we're super excited to have them as part of an integration. But we, what we did was build Scooter, which is our own AI food tracker. And what we're starting to see from athlete behavior when they actually understand how to use it is they're like, oh my god, this is like a game changer because you can just talk to Scooter like your friend. So if you were saying to me, like if I said to you, what did you have for breakfast this morning, Seth? What did I have for breakfast this morning? I had a, a banana, some cereal, and um, four halves of an English muffin with peanut butter and jam. Okay. So now you could be a little bit more specific when talking to Scooter. So you might say, um, I had a medium banana with four ha- well, with two English muffins, and let's call it two tablespoons of peanut yeah. butter with what was the other thing you had? Uh, some jam. So let's Maybe call like it a, a, tables, a tablespoon two tablespoons of jam. Yeah. And what else? Uh, the English muffins. So it was like yeah. half. So two English muffins. Two English muffins. And was there something else in there? Was it- yes. Did you say cereal? No. Uh, what was the cereal? Uh, cereal was, oh my goodness, you're making me think. This is terrible. <laughs> I can't remember this. Uh, I think it was uh, Raisin Bran. You're going to say Captain Crunch or something like that. You're really <laughs> yeah. embarrassed. Reese's Puffs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's say you you literally, uh, you were there and like before you ate it, and this is also what athletes are finding. So what you can start to do is talk to Scooter before and actually plan your meal before you eat it and get an understanding of, oh, wow, Maybe if I eat all thing. that, I'm going to be way over. I'm going to reduce that down or I'm not going to eat the f- – two English muffins, I'm going to eat one. So you might say, I had two English muffins with two tablespoons of jam, two tablespoons of peanut butter, a half a cup of raisin bran with a cup of milk and one medium banana. And you can literally say that entire sentence to Scooter just by talking into your phone. Scooter will take a little bit of time to think and then it will log each individual ingredient with all the macros and then mm. compare it to what we're recommending in terms of Based macros and calories meal. for that meal. Yes. And so it's now you're gamifying a little bit and you're not – the cool thing is you're not thinking about calories here. You're just thinking about food. And what you're doing is actually educating yourself subconsciously about portions. So you might look at that and you go, okay, your recommended for breakfast, Seth, was 30 grams of protein, 15 grams of – Uh, fat and let's call it 50 grams of carbs you log all that and you're like oh man i'm eating 120 grams of carbs based on this okay edit remove one muffin remove one tablespoon of jam remove one tablespoon of uh, peanut butter how does that look oh that's actually bang on perfect put the put the other muffin away 
because that was just being a little bit greedy. You didn't need. <laughs> you saw it in front of you. When food's in front of you as a human being, what do you do? You yeah. eat it. Yeah, I'm going to eat it, yeah. You're going to eat it. It's the same as walking through an aisle at, uh, you know, the supermarket at checkout. You're like, oh, yeah, I'll just have that Mars bar. Yeah, oh, so when that. you're hungry. I'm it's hungry. all there. So, yeah. and, now, and now what athletes are seeing is that ability just to talk to something not search through a list of like, you know, you're on my fitness power and you're typing in yeah, English forever. muffin, English muffin, and you've got to search through the list. Okay. It's not always going to be a hundred percent accurate, but you know what? Back to what we said, trends, you look at that and you go, holy hell, two, two English muffins with two tablespoons of jam and two tablespoons of peanut butter. I had no idea it was that much. And again, it's now you're changing behavior. And changing behavior is what nutrition is about. Mm. At the, the very crux of it, changing behavior and understanding what you need based on your requirements and what your purpose is. Yeah. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Well, I'm sold. Sign <laughs> me up. Yeah. I like when I try it now, especially with that, the integration with training peaks, which which is happening now. Like it's working now, right? The training oh, peaks been, integration. Well, I mean, training peaks actually, we, we were the first company to integrate with training peaks. Okay. So other companies have claimed <laughs> that they're the first to do it. We've been doing it for two and a half years. Nice. Um, the relationship with Training Peaks is exceptional. They're probably one of our yeah, uh, favorite partners because they're so supportive of what we're doing. Uh, the yeah. team, Jeremy and Dirk and, you know, all the guys there, Tim, Connor, they're just they're great guys. They get it. Um, you know, they – allow us to share information and education through uh, articles that they share to their users and their coaches, their athletes and coaches. They're always working with us to try and improve our product and their product. You know, they, they allow us to push the athletes. So we did a, a really cool thing, which I think coaches love now. It's this, what we call a two way sync. So, an athlete's fuel-in program from their daily macros, but also their meals and their in-session fueling now gets pushed into training peaks. So if you've got a coach, your coach can see what you should be consuming on a daily basis in terms of total macros, calories, but also the meal structure. And then if there is in-session fuel, also what you should be doing. So as a coach, you now can say to an athlete, hey, did you follow the nutrition plan today? Oh, no, I didn't. Sorry. Oh, did you have the, they were recommending, you know, 60 to 70 grams of carbs in that threshold session. Did you get it in? No. Okay. The coach then looks at the numbers and goes, well, geez, look at, look at your fifth, your fifth rep. You sucked. (laughs) Yeah. You you couldn't hold the power. How about you try doing the nutrition that they're recommending and let's repeat the session and compare. Oh. Next time they do it, they eat something before the session. They eat something during that session. Suddenly the power output's better. Okay, now your yeah. adaptation's going to improve. And that's, that's again, what we're trying to solve is like bring that elite professional sports model of like, yes, you've got a nutritionist. Yes, you've got a coach. Yes, you've got an athlete. Maybe you've got other people in your circle and they have visibility over it. And I think that's... Again, that's that's part of athlete development. That's part of getting mm-hmm. better as as a human being. So yeah, so for you, tra- training peaks integration is great. Um, yeah, we integrate with TriDot. TriDot's um, been pretty incredible as well with with the way that they've assisted us. I think we're the only company awesome. to integrate with TriDot uh, from a nutrition perspective. So yeah, they they've done some really cool features which allow uh, athletes to pick things like default times of day and time of session, which then means that those tri-dot athletes, their plan when they first get it is absolutely on point every time from session start time. So their meals are all perfectly placed. So I think tri-dot, the way they've got AI integrated, um, I think that's, um, I think for some people, it's not for everyone. Yeah, it's the same with nutrition. Like not everyone, some people want to speak to a human being and I guess we have that ability within Fuel In. You can book a consult and if you want to yeah. talk to me for whatever God knows reason, you can talk to yeah. me. But, um, you know, you can talk to Megan and Alan. But, you know, I think AI, as you were saying, and we're excited about AI. I think TriDot's excited about AI. And 
I think the way they're gamifying training, making it a little bit fun, reactive, predictive. Mm-hmm. I think it. I think it's cool. I think it's yeah. It is. It's super interesting because going back to like when I recorded episodes with Mark Allen or Scott Tinley, and you know hearing about them strapping on peanut butter jars to their bikes for an Ironman, and like that was their that was their plan. Just to think how far this. I, I hesitate to even say this sport, but just like the scientific approach to athleticism at a professional level, especially over the past, just since I've been involved in it in four years is like, seems to have made leaps and bounds. So I guess my question then is where does fuel in need to be for you to feel like, all right, we, we have, we've gotten to a place where like when I originally set out for my vision for this or for our vision for this, like this is, we've reached that place and now we're kind of building on top of that. Do you ever reach that place? I don't know. No. <laughs> I don't <Yeah>. know. <laughs> I, uh, if you talked internally to my team, they'd probably say, uh, I don't dollars. think Scott, Scott's ever. No, not dollars. I think they'd probably say, fuck, would Scott, Scott shut up about the next iteration and what's coming next? Uh, I yeah, don't that's think the founder, man. I don't think I'm ever, you know, like I think we all do a great job in our own individual way between Jonathan and Garrett, um, you know, the founders, and we, we do our – we each have our sort of areas that we try and improve the company in. And I guess mine's the product and Garrett's is the product as well. I mean, mine's more the actual, the backbone of it. And what can we do better to improve athlete experience where his is probably more the, the back end and then what's actually being shown in terms of that. But yeah, I don't know. It's, it's not the dollars, the, the, the dollars, I mean, honestly, I mean, I think we we spoke about it previously. I mean, what for a year I didn't take a salary. And the year after yeah. that was, if you saw the numbers that I was taking, it was pretty horrific. Uh, it's only been this year that we're starting to like get a little bit of a salary. So it's you know, it's not all. I think everyone thinks everything's rosy when you're in a tech business, but it's uh, it's pretty bloody hard. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I think we're starting to see some of those fruits of the labor now, which is really nice, but that means we're going to then reinvest that money back into the tech with this, you know, new app release, the build, the the technology behind that. So you obviously have like an improvement in the UX and UI, but I think the, the data uh, capabilities and the, the way in which we collect and present that data back to the athletes will be improved. So I think we're always about, the athlete and improving the athlete experience and the athlete outcomes. That's, that's, I guess that's what we stand for as a company. It's, it's not, it's, it's more about the athlete, I think. And yeah, you get sent messages. It, it's so cool. Like we get these random messages all the time and it's athletes mm-hmm. just going, yeah, holy shit. Like I just crushed my race and I've never felt so good or I got a message from another athlete the other day and they were like, oh, you probably don't know this, but this athlete recommended um, fuel in to me and they just won their age group at, uh, on the weekend in their, in their Ironman and they're just like, I just wanted to reach out to you and tell you how cool this is. And yeah, that makes you feel good. She, uh, Charlotte Clark, I mean, she's a, a young pro. She's just crushing it at the moment i mean she had some bike issues and still came sixth on the weekend and Mm. again like history of under fueling this notion of just under like oh light is better and i don't need to eat here and whatnot and she's crushing it you know lauren hume another athlete's come on they're they're all the same jody robertson um you know history of low energy availability um jody stimson professional Mm -hmm. athletes history of low energy availability reds they're all on the program now and they're all crushing it i mean kyle smith look at kyle smith yeah man man. he He had a great race at beijing i mean well beijing london san fran yeah i mean he's just getting better and better and like we're a small piece in that puzzle but the nutrition is i mean he's loving it he's like He's just loving. I mean, he's got his one of his best mates has just come over to Girona um, to be with him, and he the reason he wanted his mate to come over was to help him with cooking and and getting all the you know the yeah. di- dialing in you know the sweat rate test, the carb capacity testing that we do in appropriate sessions. 
He's helping with lactate, um, you know, just and then helping prepare food for him because he knows how much he's got to eat. And as we yeah. come in, as we come into Ibiza and then the finals of the T100 and then Taupo, it's all just about dialing it in. And it, yeah, I mean he's a bigger guy too. Yeah, was yeah. it seven, 76, between 70, 76, 78 kilos. That's pretty big for, a, you know, a triathlete. Um, yeah. But his numbers are terrifying on the bike. Yeah. So what he, I hear you saying is if I sign up for fuel and my FTP will increase by 50 watts by world champs. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> Mate, <laughs> you never know. Uh, I mean, you know John Thorman? Do you know John Thorman? Flo- I don't know John uh, flow cycles, uh, the wheels, flow wheels, amazing. Oh, no, wheels. but I want to know them. Do you not know? I want to get them on. Oh man, no, FLO, FLO wheels. Yeah, I used to only that. Were, those are my first ever race wheels I bought from somebody, and they made some killer sounds on the road. Like, yeah, I sound yeah, like man. a jet rolling up. I think, I think, I'll just say out there, I know f all about wheels, but everyone that I speak to is like, man, they are the bee's knees. They are yeah. awesome, and John. John is such a hero. I think I'm, that might have been one of the first podcasts I ever went on. And oh, he has a podcast too? Oh, his cla- yeah, yeah, great podcast. And his, his claim, actually, what's well, a cool claim is that's how Jan heard about me. So Jan Fredino was listening to that podcast of me and John oh, talking, nice. and then Jan reached out to me after hearing me yap on around something. And so I said to John that, and John's obviously a massive fan of yarns, and he was like, dude, yeah. that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. So, <laughs> Fanboying it up. Yeah, yeah, man, that's great. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking to – they've got, a like, a cycling team uh, that we're looking to integrate with and help their cyclists and their members just Step improve their nutrition. And yeah, yeah, I think the app and the program is part of it, but then it's, like, the community, and that's what we want to continue to build as well is, like – yeah, how can we help all these athletes from triathletes, cyclists, runners, just to become better? I, I mean, whether you want to say better human beings, but, you know, better athletes, healthier athletes yeah. and higher performing athletes. And I think yeah. nutrition is absolutely central to that. Yeah. It seems like, at least in the public eye, from kind of watching from the outside in, that you guys have started to focus more on your professional athlete relationships obviously not just within triathlon, Nikki, we talked a little bit about Justin Barsho from yeah. Supercross Motocross World and, you know, obviously I'm from Triathlete World. Is that is that continuing to flourish? Like, is that a, a pretty big push point for you guys to continue to gather data specifically from that <clears throat> elite side? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Isn't it? Like the elite athletes are the, the pointy end of the spectrum, I guess, from a, a marketing perspective, they're great. They work like mm-hmm. a lighthouse. Um, I think from a data set, they're super interesting. I think yeah. from an inspirational and aspirational aspect, I think that's what, you know, the age groupers and the everyday heroes like, you mm-hmm. know, warriors look up to. So um, we don't tend to actively chase uh, these pros. A lot of them reach out to us and then we have discussions with them and see if it, if it makes sense. Uh, Justin, Justin Barcy is a good example. He reached out to me and uh, just for those of you who don't know, Justin's a you know supercross uh, motorcycle yeah. ri- racer and uh, rides with, rides with Red Bull, probably one of the best. Um, has a million followers on Instagram. I didn't realize yeah. that, um, yeah. which is pretty cool. And he reached out and he said, "Man, I think I need your help." And I was like, "What do you mean?" And he said, "Man, I'm racing these 21 year old kids." And uh, yeah, he's like, I need some help. And I'm like, how old are you? And he's only in his 30s. And I'm like, okay, yeah. cool. And yeah, we started working together. He then had, I want to say within the first week or two weeks after we signed uh, a contract, he had this horrific injury. Uh, he ripped off his uh, gracilis and semitendinosus off his uh, right leg, oh, which is his yeah. hamstring. He did a grade three MCL injury on his left knee. And he's like, oh, shit, sorry. And I said, mate, this is fine. It's a multi, you know, whether you call it a multi-ligament injury or not, but it's a, you know, serious injury. And we said, right, let's dial in the nutrition. Mm-hmm. And this this was the cool thing. He was like, let's get the nutrition right to accelerate the healing. And I'm like, absolutely bang on. And that's exactly what we do. Like I can think of, you know, whether it was rugby, whether it was, uh, you know, the hockey or, 
um, with the sailors, whenever we had a serious injury, nutrition was like bumped up massively mm. in terms of priority of importance, because if you don't get that right, you're not going to heal. And mm. so yeah, what, five, five and a half, six weeks later, after those injuries, he was back on the bike uh, wow. riding and he raced on the weekend. He unfortunately clipped the back of a tyre, back of a wheel and knocked himself out. So he had a concussion, which was oh um, nasty. So it's a, it's an extremely dangerous sport. But it is. I, th I think what we saw with his focus on nutrition whilst injured, we saw an acceleration in that rehabilitation and it's certainly a point I keep trying to have to defend and reiterate with athletes when they're like, I'm injured. I'd like to stop using fuel in. I'm like, what do you mean? You're not going to eat anymore. Like this yeah. is the time to actually double down on your nutrition and ensure you are getting the optimized amount of total energy. Cause if you under fuel whilst injured, your body can't heal because yeah. you're actually needing more energy to heal at that point. If your protein's inadequate, you're not going to heal from a muscle and tendon and bone perspective. Same with your carbohydrates. And then if you get your fat wrong and you're over consuming that, you might just pack on a heap of weight, which yeah. you probably don't want to do either. So yeah, it's, it's, again, it's probably just an education piece. It's understanding what you need and how nutrition can you know, benefit you regardless of your your physical state whether you're injured or you know training the house down it's certainly yeah. going to be beneficial in in one way or the other yeah it's so interesting with food and stuff because i i recently just had it was the craziest thing and maybe it's a sign of just getting older but i was playing monopoly with my wife for like three hours on a saturday night and i get i go to get up at like 11 p.m i'm like okay we're done for the night and man I don't know what happened, but my back was just like, cool, you're done for the next few days. And I like was walking bent over at like a 90 degree angle. Like what is happening to me? It, and I just, the whole next day just laid down and I was, I went, I, I couldn't bike for like four or five days. Um, and I was like, what happened? But something I noticed that was interesting during that time um, I was still eating. I wasn't eating as much because for me, I don't know, some people, Whenever, like, cause I take every Saturday off completely, and that day my appetite goes way down. Like, mm. I I feel like I don't need to eat much because I'm not exercising as much, and it just it adjusts really quick. So I was eating less, but I noticed like I started to just feel, aside from my back hurting, really good, like mental clarity, and I actually lost like a pound. And I was just like, that's so weird to me because I I feel like. I probably am not doing the nutrition stuff right because some sessions I'll have probably seven out of 10, like they're pretty good average because I track like how I feel and like, did I feel strong today or do I feel weak today or whatever? Um, but I haven't figured out the whole nutritional side of things, I think, because my energy levels will kind of go up and down and I know it's tied to food somehow, but like you're saying, you know, sometimes, I don't know, I end up going for the convenient thing and it's easy to find calories um, but the nutritional dense calories is a bit more, um, takes a bit more effort. So I don't know really what I'm saying other than like, <laughs> maybe I need to just, uh, I can, I can, <laughs> I can help you. Look, effectively you're probably doing some type of fast when you're doing that on the Saturday. Yes. Mm. There's this thing called flux where, you know, if you reduce your, reduce your energy intake, you probably reduce your actual activity as well. So you probably just don't do as much. So your appetite reduces as well. And as you reduce more food intake, you reduce actually your activity. It's one of those phenomenons that sort of people don't necessarily appreciate. Um, so that's where people might be going lower and lower in calories, but they're actually also reducing, reducing, reducing their amount of energy expenditure. So it's sort of net net your weight loss, probably be explained through hydration status you take in yeah. less carbs carbohydrates attract you know three to four grams um per gram of carbohydrates you attract water so if oh, you, i did not know that that's interesting if you go on a low carb diet instantly you lose weight and people are like oh this is amazing i'm losing all this weight and it's like no you're just reducing your hydration status in the early stages so yeah again it's if you if you've got to fit into your tuxedo on a Friday, yeah, go low carb Monday to Friday, and you'll get into it, and, and then you'll yeah, bounce back sure. that night. You might not fit into that night when you have a few beers. Um, so, 
I mean, again, it comes back to consistency, Seth. Like Mm -hmm. you're doing one day of something, you lose that pound. The next day you start eating again, you put the pound on. Like that's not true weight loss. It's consistency over time with the training that will bring those results. And so, and that's where you get consistency with training, consistency with adaptations, um, consistency with being available and being able to do these sessions. You know, you, you see this, well, we certainly see it all the time, this improvement in consistency because energy levels are better, that they can actually do the full week's training, not just Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then, oh, I'm dead. I can't actually keep going at the intensity or the duration that my coach is prescribing because I just don't have the energy to do it. If you're now able to complete the entire week and you're able to do that week after week after week, you know what? Your FTP does go up. There's that level of consistency based on adaptation that is, is going to get the results that you're looking for. Well, I have to say, Scott, I'm excited to be fueling the fuel in amateur poster child for the future. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of them, mate. So uh, you, you get in line, but you've probably got a voice to uh, to talk about it. So that's exciting. Uh, yeah, we'll, look yeah. out, we'll, we'll look after you. It's fine. Yeah, so, yeah. No, I can't believe it. I'm actually shocked. Yeah, I. I stupidly should have said to you, let's get you on it, um, you know, after the first episode, uh, which would have been great. So I yeah, think that, actually that's you me. did that's and I didn't me. follow up. So I think that's uh, actually on me. I, I need to go back and listen to it. But I think you mentioned something like that. But I will follow up this time. Yeah, you're going to Taupo, aren't you? I am, yep. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll be there. We'll be there. Yeah. So that'll be cool. We'll get to I'm so yeah. excited, man. It's like a family reunion. You're still doing this now. This will be like episode 89, I think, or 90. Um and so the, that's 90 people I've met over the past year just from doing this podcast, a lot of them in our industry and in, in sport. So going to them, these races now is like almost like a little reunion, a little family reunion type thing. It's actually really cool. Uh, that's I'm excited cool. about it. Yeah. That'll be, uh, is that what, are, what races have you got coming up? Literally, that's it. I raced uh, in, in July. I did like a mid-July race and I was like, I just want to do a five-month block. I'm going to be moving to California in October and I just want to focus on training and doing it right and not rushing it. Because I think I raced for me, I raced like four or five times earlier in the season and I didn't have a lot of good builds. I felt like it was just, I don't know, racing's fun, don't get me wrong, but I want to see like more progress. So I was like, I just need to like get my head down, get out lost in the mountains, just get me on my bike and run and swim and let me do what I do and see, see what happens. So... How yeah, good. yeah, How yeah. yeah. It, I, I, it, it's funny with racing, isn't it? Like next year, I've got to, I definitely have to plan out at least one seventy point three, and potentially there is talk of Roth uh, oh, going yeah. Roth for the team, but we might do it as a relay, um, okay. which would be fun. I'll just do, I'll probably do the run, but I, I think at some point we're going to have to do, um, do a an Iron Man, I think I have to because I sort of have to because <laughs> yeah. you know you talk to athletes about these all the time. And uh, have you done one? No, I've never done a full. Uh, oh man, tell me which one you're doing. I'll sign up for it. I was thinking about doing one next year. Yeah, we'd do that. I've got a marathon this weekend. I've got Sydney Marathon this weekend. Oh man, that's a big one. Be, How many people are racing that? Thousands. Se- Seventy thousand. Seven D seven zero thousand. Seven zero thousand apparently. Are you serious? Yeah. So that's like a city I, I got, descending. On. I got a late. I got a late um, like entry because I forgot to enter and it was sold out. And so I've got wave F or G, but I'm just gonna. I've got to get up and get try and get into wave A because I'm trying to run like yeah, run around sort of that three three hour sort of mark, and I don't want to be try stuck. To break three? No, there's no way I'll break three. Like. Ah, oh, you got fueling I, on your side, man. Come yeah, on. it's funny. <laughs> I, I'll tell you. So uh, I was chatting to Jan the other night, and he was saying, "Oh, you've got your marathon coming up, don't you?" And I said, "Yeah." And he goes, "What time are you going for?" And I said, oh, "I don't know, three oh nine, three fifteen, something." Like that. And he goes, "What's wrong? Are you injured?" <laughs> I, I love was, it. <laughs> I was like, "You're such a dick." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got that, and then I've got New York. I've got New York marathon in uh, November. Oh, man. So has this been like the year of running for you then? This has been the year of running. But I, uh, yeah, another time we'll talk about, if it all goes well, I'll tell you what I did. 
because uh, I followed a pretty unique training program, um, okay. which was just three days a week. Um, so we'll see how oh, it goes. Really? Yeah, yeah, with 800 repeats called Yassos. I don't know if you know what Yassos are. But I don't. Anyway, found that. So, yeah, it was that, marathon oh, pace, and then one slow. So it definitely was a lot more intensity than mm-hmm. I did for my previous marathon. So it's going to be really interesting to see just how – how it sort of transpires and what yeah. happens. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, cool, if, it, if it so, doesn't go well, then I'll know why. If it goes really well, I'll uh, keep experimenting and pushing it. Yeah. But the one thing that uh, certainly hasn't changed is uh, carbohydrate intake. So uh, I've been smashing smashing the carbs on that. I did, I did metabolic testing um, leading into this, which was really cool. So um, I'm going back and doing the repeat. Yeah, you know, again, my respiratory quotient at um, at rest was super high in terms of fat oxidation. So despite mm. smashing carbs, still, you know, effective at uh, utilizing fat at rest, which was good. And then in terms of that crossover point, it was fairly high in terms of speed and heart rate, um, which was great to see. So it's going to be really interesting seeing the repeat measures and see whether that has remained, whether my ability to use fat as a fuel source at lower intensities remains despite very yeah. high carbohydrate intake in training and around training. So yeah, uh, we'll see. So I'll, uh, I'll let you know about the results. Yeah, for sure. Well, it sounds like you're excited then. I mean, that's going to be a huge race. I can imagine racing with 70,000 people, but yeah. I, I hope, is there a tracker we can track you? There is actually, I think you jump on the, uh, the Sydney marathon app and you can, you can track that way. We'll see. It's always, uh, it's always interesting when you're doing these things because now you really throw yourself out there and people can yeah. like, you know. Yeah, I feel like I should release this episode early just so we can get that <laughs> part, part out there because otherwise I think you would have run it by then. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share it on social media maybe yeah. and uh, people can rip into me if I fail miserably. So Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll comment. Didn't Jan say, what's, why are you yeah, injured? Exactly. Three hours? You got uh, You got to throw yourself out there, don't you? Look, if yeah. you... We were having that chat as well about a couple of athletes and it was like, you know, if you don't fully engage, it gives you an excuse. Mm. If you don't do everything and you can't say, I did everything leading into this. And yeah, there's probably a couple of things I could have done better. Maybe I flogged myself a little bit too hard and, but I'm not going to let that be an excuse. Look, if I, if something happens, it happens. You just live with it. Yeah. But for those people who like, they just allow themselves those excuses. I think that's that's the difference between a great athlete and maybe one who's just a wannabe. Yeah, for sure. So, anyway. Well, I have to ask you one more question before I let you go because I know yeah, you probably yeah. do have to go. Yeah. But I would feel bad if I didn't. I, I, and I wouldn't feel bad. I would actually just really want to ask, like, how's the family doing? How are How is life outside of fueling doing? Uh, yeah, it's good. Um, little Jackie boy. Uh, so he, he has been diagnosed with autism. So I actually am running for Aspire uh, Aspect, sorry, um, Autism Australia. So I've actually raised oh, wow. just under seven thousand dollars, which is really cool. Um, yeah. Friends, friends, family, and athletes have all supported the cause. So that's pretty exciting. I put up some pretty cute photos of him. So it's pretty hard not to uh, donate money to. Him. He's a cute yeah, little kid. Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, so he's things. good. He's um he's in therapy. Um, he's still um nonverbal, so he still doesn't speak. He's coming up to three years old. So uh, yeah, I remember you touched on that on before. That. Yeah, working on that. Uh, he does a little bit of sign language now, uh, which is good for communication. So we're working yeah. on that. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it is what it is, I guess, with him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's tough, but it's. Yeah, he, he brings a lot of enjoyment into our lives as well, despite some yeah, talks where sure. it's it's tough. And then little Izzy, Izzy turned one. She's 13, uh, nearly 14 months now. And, uh, yeah, she's just – I think she's going to be the problem child, to be fair. Yeah. She's she's <laughs> definitely got a naughty streak to her, and uh, she's, she's going to be a wild child, I think, and she's incredibly loud. I think she inherited my lungs. So, uh, yeah. so that's good. And then uh, Mel, my partner, she's – I guess she just – keeps it together you know for everyone and you know i think she does a remarkable job at organizing everything and yeah. keeping keeping everything on track you know i i do my thing with work and i think sometimes you forget just how hard it is to keep mm. 
the family going and all the appointments, sure. you know, the doctor's appointments, the therapy appointments, the organizing care workers and all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, I probably probably don't say it enough, but, uh, yeah, she's she's pretty instrumental in keeping the, the family together. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can imagine it's difficult. I mean, so a lot of my best friends now are having kids. I haven't had kids yet because my wife and we're on the five-year plan and we're going to move to California. And so that is in the future. But yeah. I'm seeing them go through these. They all say like, oh, yeah, enjoy your single days or whatever. Because, or I say single, excuse me, childless days because, you know, everything kind of will change and the world shifts and it's no longer about me. So I actually look forward to that to a degree. But um, It definitely shifts, I, mate. <laughs> yeah. That's our bird. So, cool. what, for me, and then last question, I promise. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, like I'm planning to have kids probably in the next year to, or two years. Yeah, so, awesome. uh, you're you're getting the the full experience, obviously. And you know, you said Jackie boy, like he's going through this. I don't even. I mean, with having autism, like there's obviously a different level of parenting required there. So, I'd be curious if you had any parenting advice or just like character building advice to be prepared for anything like that? Don't have expectations. Yeah. That's probably the number one. Like I think, yeah, look, I, I played sport, I played rugby, all those sorts of things. And yeah, you, I think in the back of your mind as a dad, you have these <laughs> thoughts of aspirations of your child emulating whatever you did and then beyond. And I think, it's e it's ego as much as anything. Mm. So I think you have these moments, or I certainly have these moments where uh, you get a bit down on yourself because you know maybe what you thought was going to happen isn't going to happen. And but I think they, you know, what I imagine will happen is you'll we will learn what his gifts are mm -hmm. over time, and whatever those are, like that's what he'll bring to the party. Yeah. And and so I think it's just letting go of what your what you believe is normal and what you believe is, you know, a standard that you believe in, I guess. Mm. And and just not having those, you know, just let them grow up in whatever way they grow up and just support them, I guess. And it's easier said than done. I, I struggle with that. Um yeah. but I guess that's what I'm trying to get my head around. It's interesting you say that because I think that's the thing that I'm actually going to struggle with the most. So I just turned 32 on Tuesday and, um, and that's exactly 16 years living with my dad and 16 years without my dad. So I've had for a very long time this idea of like, oh, I'm going to have a son and I'm going to raise him to adulthood. And like, that'll be like my, my mission to be there present through the whole time. But I've noticed that I've started to, because of my athletic aspirations and business aspirations, like, and music aspirations, like, oh, I'm going to, you know, he's going to pick up one of these things and we're going to kind of drive it home. I mean, I've been conscious of like, oh, I don't want to like live vicariously through my children to a degree where I'm forcing it upon them. But I think that's going to be something I struggle with. So hold me accountable when that comes around. I'll call it's, you up. It's exactly like what you're describing. And you may have a girl. Yeah. You, you, you've you already, and you on. can see, you've already set yourself. I'm going to have a boy and I'm going to bring him up this way. And it's like, and then the girl pops out and you're like, oh, okay, maybe we're not going to do that. And then you'll be yeah. trying to, you know, throw a baseball with her and all these things. Yeah. I, I throw a rugby ball at Izzy now and she, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so, yeah, yeah. look, I, I think it's just talk to all your mates who've got kids and, you know, you bounce, I'd certainly bounce off my mates who've got kids. Most of them are 15 and 16 years old. So, you know, they're in completely different sort of time frames to me, but it's – Everyone's an individual, man. That's all I'll say. And uh, your kids, even you have two kids with the same same woman and they've come from you and they're completely different. And you think what mm. you did with number one is going to work with number two and it's just not the case. So yeah. uh, just enjoy it. Uh, mate, sure. I'm, I actually have to jump off because I have yeah, a, no, a call yeah. with an athlete. Thank but, you. Uh, as always, pleasure. And, yes, uh, thank you I so look, much for taking the time. I look forward to listening to this one, mate. And let's get you on fuel in. All right. Sounds good. I'll reach out to you. Thanks, man. Thank you so much, mate. Bye-bye. All right. See you. Bye. Huge shout out to Scott. Just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Really awesome to have him on and dive deep on everything that he's got going on. Obviously, super passionate about health and wellness and nutrition and uh, being able to offer people a plan and an executable plan to come up with a way to 
get the quality and nutrition you need to fuel your workouts, to fuel your life, and to keep energy up. If you made it this far on the podcast, though, just want to say thank you so much. If you don't mind liking, commenting, subscribing, reviewing, leaving any kind of a comment anywhere, and following, all those things really do continue to help push this podcast forward. And really appreciate if you could help do that, uh, especially reviewing on the Spotify platform. If you also want to sign up for our newsletter, you can do that at the stupidquestions.show website. And that is it. All I have for you this evening. Thank you so much. And we will catch you on the next one. And one last thing, if you are interested in trying out the Fuel In app and everything that it offers in relation to training and getting fit with good nutrition, you can go over to fuelin.com and use code QUESTIONS20 to get 20% off your first month of Fuel In. I've been using it now for a month and it's been really great. It's super simple to enter the things that you are eating and it gives you great feedback based on your training peaks data and training ahead to let you know how you should pre-fuel and post-fuel for all your workouts. So go and check it out at fuelin.com and use QUESTIONS20 as the code to get 20% off your first month.